The Django REST framework is a flexible toolkit for building web APIs using Python. Bobby Stearman teaches us course about how to use the Django REST framework. Bobby is a senior software engineer and has created many popular tutorials. Hi everyone and welcome to this course that I'm putting together for free CodeCamp. Over the next hour or so, I'll be showing you everything you need to know to build your own web API using Django REST framework. I'm Bobby Stearman from Dig Coding and welcome to this course. Let's begin. Hi and welcome to the start of this course. So let's cover this off straight away. What is Django REST Framework? Well, it's a toolkit that allows you to build web APIs, okay? So think of it as a standalone API where your clients can make requests such as get, post, put, delete requests to you. Your API receives this information, it validates the information, and it responds to the user. That's essentially what we're trying to do here. It's very powerful, it's very popular. A lot of projects that I work on these days are using Django REST framework. Um, some of the projects that I use or I work on at the minute just use Django REST framework as a back end and then they use a React or a Vue front end, so a single page application. Like I said, it's very popular, very po uh, powerful. That's why I decided to put this course together. It will take me about an hour to an hour and a half to finish the course. It's made up of eight modules. The first two modules are cloning down a repository that we've got on GitHub. And then module three onwards will be um, looking at building models, serializers, routers, and uh, views. Okay. By the end of this course, we will have a fully functional web API where we can make requests to and we will get responses. And in the background, it'll be saving information to a database. Okay, each module comes with a set of instructions, so step-by-step -step guides, and this can all be found on GitHub, which I'll show you in a moment or two. I will be here following along every single step of the way. Like I said, at the end of this course, we'll have an app that hopefully you can then refactor and add it to your own project. Okay, so let's begin. What you can see on the screen is Django REST Framework's homepage. Now, this is a great reference point for their documentation. It's got examples, it shows you how to install stuff. It's fantastic. If ever you hit a brick wall or a dead end, this is always a good place to start. Always read the docs. So I'll be referencing this a few times throughout the course. Another thing, Docker. This project is a Django project that's entirely Dockerized. So it stands to reason that it's a good idea if you have Docker and Docker Compose installed on your local machine. That way when you clone everything down, you can follow along with me every single step of the way. It just makes it a lot easier when putting a course like this together and it negates the need for prerequisites like Python and curl or HTTPy on your machine. So by installing Docker, it allows you just to keep up and be a lot, um, it's a lot more fluid. Okay, so pause the video, install Docker, and come back. Last link that I want to show you is GitHub. You do not need a GitHub account to get your hands on this code. It's a public repository. If you don't have a GitHub account, click the green button here, download zip, extract the files on your local machine, and you've got the code. Okay, so you don't need an account. However, if you do have an account, you have some options of cloning this repository and I'll show you those in a second. So the project is called DRF underscore course. It has numerous different branches. Main is default. That's just kind of the, the empty box, if you like, hasn't got much. It's the very, very um, bare bones of the project. You have a complete branch. That's the complete project. Um, and if you clone that down, you skip forward to the end of the course and you've got all of the code. Um, I would advise you to watch the video as it's a much um, better way of doing a deeper dive on DRF. Okay, and then you've got one module or one branch for each module. So there's eight modules in the course. Module one and module two are set up, configurations, and module three onwards is building out the app. Okay, so these are the directories and the files, and then you've got a readme file. Okay, so Bit of an intro, so welcome to the course. It's great if you're looking to learn DRF, and it's also great if you're looking to build an API. Like I said, it's popular, it's powerful, and it really will be a good string to your bow. It does say prerequisites of Python 3.10. 
I do use uh, matching case statements in this course um, and it only got released in Python 3.10. If you've got it on your local machine, great. However, the containers in Docker already have Python 3.10 in there, so you shouldn't really need them. Also, I go on to say that um, you, it's handy to make calls to the API to have curl or HTTPy installed on your machine so that you can make calls. But again, I've got containers built in this project with it all loaded up, so you don't need to install anything. So that's why I say install Docker. Okay, let's get started. When we clone this down, we want to clone it down into a directory on your uh, local machine called DRF underscore course. That is our root directory. I reference it a lot throughout the course, so please call it by that name. Don't call it Bobby's course, Billy's course. Call it DRF underscore course. It just makes our life a lot easier. I've already got one on my machine and my text editor, which in this case is VS Code, is already open in that directory. Okay, so I've skipped that part. But if you can open up this directory and then take the clone code from here, I have an SSH key. You can use this uh, GitHub CLI if you have it or the HTTPS option. I have an SSH key, so I'll be using that. And lastly, before I open up VS Code, um, each of these modules are recorded individually as well on my own uh, YouTube channel. So if you like this course and you like this content, then I advise having a look at the Dig Coding channel and the playlists on there because, like I say, if you like this content, you'll probably like the other content that I put out there. So that's that. I've copied over my git clone command. Let's open up VS Code. As you can see here, let's make it a bit bigger. I've got DRF course here and it's a live instance of my VS Code. So, new terminal. Right click that in there. The little full stop at the end here will clone it down into DRF. I have a passphrase, so I'll bop that in there. And there we have it. Great. So what I like about VS Code is, especially when you're coding in um, Python and doing Django apps, um, VS Code has a whole bunch of extensions that make it act like an IDE um, and it's very, very good when you're, you're using Python. So um, I would strongly advise that you get it installed in your machine if you're following along. And also, the reason I'm using Markdown language um, for the steps is in um, VS Code it has a preview option. So you can actually preview that Markdown and it renders it like it would in a web page. So this is what we get. We get a directory called backend, we get a directory called steps, and then we have a git ignore, we have a docker compose file, which we need if we're firing up the project. We have a template env, a readme file, and a server uh, py. Don't worry about the server py file. One of the containers that we're building in docker is actually a Flask app, um, and it allows us to just to fire up another application and make requests to the API. Uh, the reason I'm using Flask is because it's um, it's a lot easier to set up a Docker container using Flask than it is Django um, in this instance. So let's not worry about that too much. Now let's go ahead and open up module one steps and open it up as a preview. And I'm hoping that's gonna look okay on the screen. I'm gonna close my terminal for now. There we go. So I'll say this now and not throughout the course. Each module has a start, a middle and an end. The start will show you what your config, your directory configuration should look like, where your files are, how they're configured. When I watched previous courses to this years and years and years ago, um, I found that I'll be following along and I'll be saving files in the wrong directories and the, wrong di the directory to be called something slightly different. I've tried to be as thorough as possible. This is what your directory should look like at this present moment in time. And at the end of the file, right at the bottom here, this is what it should like, look like at the end of the module. Hopefully that's gonna be helpful for you. And the middle part of the uh, module is the instructions and the walk, the step-by-steps that I'll be walking along with you. So look, we've got a backend directory, a steps directory, and a few files, so we're good to go. If you're ever in doubt, um, and you've you've cloned this down from Git, and you can change and pull down the uh, code from the module branch as and when, and that should reconfigure things for you. Okay, steps commands. 
You should now have a directory called DRF course in your development directory. This will be known as your root directory. In this module, we will be starting our project. To do this, we need to create a virtual environment. Now, this is Dockerized. We don't necessarily need the virtual environment when we've got the Dockerized project. However, I do reference some bits and pieces in the REST framework directory that we're installing. Now that's all installed in Docker, but it's handy to have the virtual environment in the project also so I can open up those files. So just bear with me. So first thing you want to do, you want to invoke this command, this Python command, and we'll open up our terminal. Make sure you're in the root directory and we're creating a virtual environment and we're calling it VENV. I'm on a Windows machine, so to fire up that virtual environment, I use this command here. Okay, and how do I know it's running? I've got V and V in brackets there. Can you see that? Now we can go ahead and we can install all the dependencies of the project. I want this to be more about Django REST framework rather than uh, Python and PIP and Django. So I've already created a requirements file which is in back end, which is here. It looks like this. Now, when we run the following command, it will cycle through these and install them into our virtual environment. Okay. So go back to the module and we will take this command, pip install, and we'll point it towards the requirements file in back end and it cycles through and it'll install everything. Now you can see one of the things we're installing is Django REST framework, Django REST framework JSON API, and Django filters. They're all working together in this project. Okay. Uh, we've also got python.env. This allows us to um, identify environment variables in a file in the project. Um, and that way we can have secrets and API keys and things like that in here. Okay, and this is the, this is the file that we'll be using for that. Okay. This little command at the bottom here, the bit in yellow is saying, uh oh, you need to upgrade pip. You can do that. It's not necessary really, but let's go ahead and do that. Paste that, and that should go ahead and then uh, that'll update pip, and you won't see that problem anymore. Good, right? Let's go back to module one. It's a lot easier when I'm um, not mirroring my screen because uh, my text is far bigger, so I don't get to see as much. So uh, we've installed everything, right? Now we've installed Django. That's the most important one, actually, in this instance. Um, Django 4.1.3, okay? So that's the version of Django that we've got installed. By installing it, we now have access to the Django commands and Django admin commands. One of those commands we're gonna use is start project, okay? So we use Django admin start project. I don't wanna to dwell too much on this because it's not a Django course, it's a Django REST framework course. Um, there we go. What we're doing, we're starting the project and we're dumping it in back end. We should now see this DRF course on the left hand side here. Good. Secrets. We want to copy the template that comes with the course and we want to call it .env. So we now have this file here and this will be picked up in the Django project. So it's looking for a secret key, it's looking for allowed hosts, okay? But it's already pre-configured. You don't want to worry too much about that. And that, when I say module one and two is all about setup, that really is, okay? So our configuration in module one, let's close this, should now look like this. We've got back end, we've got a new DRF course, which is here, you see that? We've got an init file, we've got ASCII, WSGI, URLs and settings, okay? That comes straight out of the box when you set up a Django project. We've got a new directory called virtual EMV or VENV. If I open that up, it's got include lib and scripts. In lib, we'll have site packages. And if you look in here, this is everything that we just installed. We've installed Django REST Framework, loads of other stuff, but Django REST Framework is really the heart of this course, okay? If you go in here, uh, we've got files such as serializers. So we'll be, in, we'll be um, importing this in some of the projects. Some of these classes and methods will be calling quite a lot in this course. So we'll become familiar with this setup soon enough, okay? But that is the end of module one. What we'll do is we will have a quick sneak peek here of module two. So we'll close this. We're going to steps module two. In the next module, we will be uh, we'll be setting up a new app called Core, and we'll be adding some bits and pieces to the settings file.
Okay. So that's module one. See you in the next module. Okay, this is module two. Um, what we're going to be doing is having a look at this module two, which is in the steps directory. We'll open it up and we'll open it up as a preview. And as I said in the last module, these files are broken down as the top, middle, and the bottom. The top and the bottom show you the configuration, start and finish. And the bit in the middle is all about following steps that we can follow along together. I know that this is correct because I just completed it in module one. Just make, make sure that your configuration is where it looks or what it looks like on the screen before moving on. And if not, just pull down from Git. Okay, so Django makes it easier to build better web apps more quickly with less code. That's why I love Django so much, right? So in this module, we'll be creating a Django app. A Django app is a Python package that is specifically intended for use in Django projects. An application may use common Django conventions and it's normally all bundled up, right? So we're gonna create two apps in this project. One of them is gonna be called Core. The other one will be called e-commerce. We won't bother ourselves with e-commerce just yet. Let's focus on Core. So this app will hold logic around core functions of the app. In this case, it's gonna be a contact us model, serializer and view. So a user can fire some information at us at an endpoint. We'll take the information and we'll save it into the database. In this instance, it will be a username, an email. So a username, a first and last name, an email and a message. Okay? And we'll store that in the database, which is quite helpful stuff, okay? What we want is python manage.py start app core. That is the command we're gonna be using, but you need to be in the backend directory. It won't work in DRF course because we're calling the manage.py file, which is in here. Okay, so cd backend, and then we'll add that command here, and it should start a new app called core. You see that? We now have access to it. However, we do need to tell Django that that core is active. So we need to change some bits in the settings file. So let's take this code. I don't wanna glance too much over the, um, the, the steps, um, but I, I don't want, also don't wanna read it straight from the screen. So uh, we need to change some settings, okay? So there's kind of three or four parts we need to change. First thing we need to do is change the imports at the top of the screen so that we can actually access env um, or environment variables. We're using python.env for that. And we just need to uh, invoke or instantiate it so we have access to it. So if we open up Django, Django so DRF course and then go into settings.py, this settings file has been constructed straight from Django, okay? So it's got no changes in there at all. You wanna change this first line or line 13 and everything above it and just paste in what I've just copied from the module. We've still got the path, except now we're importing .env, we're importing operating system, which is a Python package, and now we're instantiating .env with load.env, okay? It's not DRF stuff, but it just, it's just really helpful so that we can store information outside of the settings. Next thing we wanna do, we wanna change secret key debug and allowed hosts. So go back in steps, pick this up, and drop it over this here. And what that's now doing is, rather than looking at the secret key that comes straight out of the box, it's looking at the secret key in the env file, debug out of the env file, and the allowed hosts out of env. Which are these here? Okay, great stuff. You're all with me. Next, we need to tell Django that we want to use the core app that we've just created, but also we want to use Django extensions, which is a great um, package that you can install into a project. Um, we're gonna be using Django filters and REST framework. REST framework and Django filters work together. Um, REST framework gives us access to all of the view sets, the serializers, the routers, and things like that. So essentially you add it installed app so we can actually use Django REST framework in the project. So we wanna copy this and we'll drop that directly in installed apps, okay? Django extensions, again, it's not DRF, but you have a load of model uh, abstracts or mod uh, module abstracts um, that we can just use in our models in the project to allow us to have loads of fields without having to code it up and it just speeds things up. Good, next, we need to add some specific Django REST framework variables. Go to the bottom of the settings file, so pick it up from the steps file and drop it in here. 
okay? So what are we creating here? We're creating a variable called REST Framework. So Django REST Framework is looking for this variable in the settings file, okay? Um, this is taken straight from Django REST Framework.org um, and it's kind of a basic setup. It uh, lets, it, it's a load of key value pairs um, in a dictionary and it just adds some settings, some bespoke settings to the instance of Django REST Framework that we're playing with. Uh, one project might want token authentication, might want or another one might want pagination, things like that. Okay, so these, you can see we've got exception handlers, we've got default pass classes, renderer classes. What else have we got? We've got test request default format. So when we write some tests later, this is the default format of the data that is being sent. Okay, and we'll add to this throughout the course. So we will be doing some token authentication in this course. You'll be pleased to know. I think that's in uh, module five. Um, and yeah, okay, they are the settings. URLs, okay, so um, normally when you're working with a Django project, you get you do things in a certain order. So you install the packages, change the settings, add the URLs to the URL conf because some of the packages require that. And then you go about and you create apps, models, forms, views, URLs, okay, in that kind of order. So we'll go through that. But this is the URL conf. And what we're going to do here is we're going to add this to URLs. Straight out of the box, it wires up admin. We're not going to change that because it's handy to have access to the built-in admin page in this course. So we'll keep it as it is. But instead, what we've now brought in is two things. So we've got REST Framework import routers. Think of a router in Django, um, Django REST Framework as a way of directing, routing traffic to your API to the correct view. Okay, that's what we're doing there. So when a request comes into an endpoint that we specify, the router will help to direct that towards the view. And it's, uh, it works well with the URL patterns that Django uses. Okay, so that's why we're bringing this in here. You can write a bespoke router, um, but the default router will, um, for instance, if we're doing a retrieve call in a, um, a view set, it will already know to look for the primary key. Okay, so you can have a bespoke router that will look for um, uh, type and key, but you need to write that. We're not doing that in this course, but that is where you would, you would handle that kind of logic. Okay, migrations. Lastly, uh, we now need to migrate everything to a database. Now, we are using um, the straight out of the box database. We're not, we haven't got a PostgreSQL database or anything in this course. So by running migrate, uh, my, make migrations and migrate, we'll be creating a, a database file essentially, and that will appear in the project. So let's go ahead and use these two commands. Got my terminal, you see that? We're in the correct file, um, we're in the correct directory backend, and we click migrate. That's exactly what we're expecting to see. In Django, um, in the installed apps, certain things here like auth, and content types and sessions that have database tables. Now, um, we will be using auth especially. Um, we need those tables in our database. So we run those migrations and migrate those tables into this. This is our temporary database. This is not a production ready database or anything like that, but this is what we'll be using. So we've just done that. And we can now run a local server. So We'll do that quickly. We are going to use Docker in another module, but right now let's just fire up the server. Can you see that? And that will say everything's looking good. And if we open up my browser and go to 127, I don't know what, because just paste it in there. Oh, that's not what I wanted. I do apologize. One second. I think localhost should work. Yeah, there we go, it does work. So this is exactly what we wanna see at this point. It means we have configured things exactly where we need them to be to see um, the web API in our browser. You can see that we've got no endpoints at all, but the uh, well, the, the built-in homepage, if you like, um, is just a basic get request, and that's why you're looking at this page, okay? So in the next module, we will start building out our core app so we'll build some models, serializer, some views and routers so that we can actually make a call to an endpoint and make it all work. Good. 
where are we? So that is module two. Thank you very much, and I'll see you in module three. Okay, module three. Let's begin. I will just close down some of the bits from the last module. Let's go to steps, module three, and we'll go into preview. Good. So module one and two was all about setup and config. Okay. Arguably, you could skip to this point if you're really good at Django and you know what you're doing. You can start here. You know, it's a basic setup. So start and end. So the start configuration should look something like this, the directory configuration. We've got a core app in back end, which is good. We've got that straight out of the box stuff. Nothing fancy pants in there. Got a Docker, um, Docker file. Don't worry about that. Got DRF. We've got a, a DBSQL Lite file, which we have. We've got it here. Um, that's a new file. And then we've got everything else that we had. So we're all good to go. We don't need to change anything. But if you've you know, lost track a little bit, you can pull down from module three from GitHub. Good to go. Right. In the last module, we can uh, we wired up two, no, one new app, should I say, as a typo. What we now need to do is um, we need to create a contact us endpoint. So a user can send their name, email, a message to our back end. What we need is a module. This is a Django convention, so we create a module which translates to an SQL table with fields. Okay, okay, we need a router to direct traffic to the endpoint to a view, and then we need a serializer to serialize data. So I think a serializer is similar to a Django form. So it does a lot of the heavy lifting. So a serializer is kind of a, a, a piece of code that sits between a request coming in and the back end. Now it uh, serializes, let's say, JSON data into Python data types and then back again. So it receives information, alters that information into something that Python can read, validates it, does stuff in the background, and then it spits it back to the user. That's what a serializer is doing, very similar to a form, right? So that's what we need to write. And then we have a view. The view handles all of the, the logic. This will be a, a view set or a API view. An API view is very similar to a normal Django class-based view, um, but you, with Django REST Framework, they have some other views that we can use as well, like um, API view, view sets, um, and some built-in um, mix-ins that we can use as well. Okay, so let's start with models. Remember we do models first. So pick up the code that you can see on the screen here, copy it, go into core, go into models, Control A, Control V, okay, and then save. It will have a dodgy import. Don't worry about that. We'll cover that off in a second. But essentially, we're importing models from Django, and we've got some extensions. So remember, Django extensions give us some abstract models that we can use. Uh, a timestamp model gives us a couple of fields like created. Um, an activator model will give us a status field and a activated date and a deactivated date. And also, we'll have a title description model. That gives us a character field uh, or two character fields, text field. And the reason I'm adding those is because um, the first name and the message will be a character field and a text field. All we need to do is just direct the serializer to the correct field. And that's why I wanted to add it into the course. And then we've got a model called contact. We're inheriting some bits and pieces here, including an abstract called model. Each of the tables in this course will have a UUID as an ID field. We'll create that in a second. Got a meta class, and then we're adding an email field. So this is just the models that email field. All right. So this is this is what we'll be adding to the serializer also. And then we've got a done the string method here, which is a string representation of the model. Again, we don't need to do a deep dive on this. This is a Django Django model, and this is what the um, database will have in it. Let's construct that uh, abstract. So abstract models, you will notice that we're importing an abstract model. I've already spoken about that. Um, we're gonna have a ideal ID field in each of our models with a UUID field. So copy this here. In backend, we want a new directory. So we'll call this utils. Within that, we want a new file called dunder init.py. And then another file in there called model abstracts.py. 
and dump all of that code in there. Paste. Okay, we're bringing in UUID from a Python. That's a, that's a built-in Python package and then models. And all we're doing here is we're creating this class called model. It has an ID field, which is a primary key. Okay, so we, we're using that primary key when we're making calls to the API. And then in the class method, we're calling it, we're saying abstract equals true, which means we can then inherit that in our, in our contact. Again, let's not dwell on that too much. Okay, good. Serializers. Remember, serializer is some code that sits between the user request and the back end and, and back again. So it handles the serialization of information data. Okay, so we need to create a file in our project called serializers.py. In core, new file. Okay, and then in there, paste in this code. What are we doing? We are importing our model that we just created. For its, it's relative, that's what this, this dot is here. Uh, we're bringing in serializers. So let me touch on this quickly. So when from REST framework, import serializers. What are we doing there? We are importing from our virtual environment in this case. We're looking for REST framework and then we're looking for a file in here called serializers. Now by importing that, we now have access to all of this, okay? So in here we have the base serializer, which will be abstract. Let's minimize some of this. So when we um, when we create a serializer and we inherit serializers.serializer, it's this class that we'll be using, okay? So you can see here, we've got a default error message, we've got fields, so it's doing a lot of hard work there. Another thing we've got is a model serializer. So a model serializer is just a regular serializer, except that a set of default fields are automatically populated. So it links to a model, it's model serializer. Okay, so serializer field mapping. So this is the logic where if you've got a, a serializer field, it maps it to a model field. But this is the reason I'm showing you this is this is what we're we're importing. So a lot of courses you see online, it won't really do a deep dive on this sort of thing. You know, this import serializers from serializers. Um, what does that mean? What are we actually using? So I'm just showing you that this is what we're doing. Okay. So when we create a serializer, we're inheriting from these classes, so we have access to all of the methods and functionality within. Good. And then yeah, from framework fields, we're accessing char field an email field. Okay, they're the two fields that we're playing around with. Okay, so to create a contact serializer, we're inheriting model serializer. Remember this does the mapping to the fields. We have a name, message, and email field, very similar to Django forms. Okay, so you add a variable and then you say what field type it is, what um, widget you're going to use. This is very, very similar, except in this, name if you remember we're using a, um, a django extensions field called title description now that gives us a field called title but in the serializer we want to call it name so what we do is we point this towards the title field okay that's why we've got source equals that's what that keyword is doing and we're saying required through so we're expecting that information to come through from the client if we don't it will get a, a 404 response same again for message, we're pointing it to description and email, where well, we know there's an email field, right? So we've got an email field called email in the model. We have a class meta, and in there you direct it to the model that we're looking for, and then the fields that we want. That's it, that's all we need for the serializer. Okay, we're linking the serializer to a model that we have. All we now need to do is wire up some views. Save. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Talking of views, let's take this code. Copy, go into views in core, paste that in, and we'll save that. Okay, so um, from JSON, which is a Python package, bring in a JSON decoder error. Um, we're bringing in a JSON response from a Django package, then from dot serializers, which we just created, we're bringing in the serializer, and a few bits and pieces from REST frameworks. We've got parsers, this allows us to handle the parsing of the JSON that we're gonna be receiving from the uh, client, and we've got views, so there's a whole bunch of different views that we can handle. Let's have a look. We're going to views here. We're using an API view in this instance. Now an API view is very similar to a Django class-based view. 
um, in the way you can have a get method, a post method, so on and so forth. So it's really, really helpful if you've been working with Django for a long time, it's a good, nice, easy transition to use API views. But you have other bits and pieces in here as well that you can also use. Good, and then you've got status. So status gives us access to a whole bunch of predefined statuses that are in um, REST framework. So HTTP uh, 200 equals 200, and we use that in the responses we feed back to the client. Okay, so contact API view, passing through views.api view, which is, is it this? No, sorry, got too much open. Is this it? This is what we're passing through. Okay, so we've got a deep, uh, we've got schema, we've got as view. Okay, so remember it's a, like a class based view, and if you're going to render that to a web page in Django, you would use a dot as view at the end of it. If with a function based view, you don't need to do that. Um, we've got some other methods here that we've got. We won't go in, it's not a deep, deep dive, this is a very sort of top level. Um, so we've got a get serializer context method. Um, we've got a get serializer method. Um, and at the top here, in an API view, you need to put the serializer class. So the serializer class in this instance is a contact serializer. So we'll be using these two methods here to handle the getting of that serializer in an API view. So we now have access to that serializer. And anyway, we've then got what's the most important part of this view is the post request. So what we're doing here is we are expecting some JSON to be sent in from a client. First thing we want to do is to pass that JSON using a, the parser that's built into the Django REST framework. Um, we then use this, we send that data through to the serializer to handle the um, serialization of information. Remember pointing it to the right fields. And if the information that's coming in is valid, i.e. there, there was a, a name, a message, and an email, and the email is an email type, um, data type, then it will be valid. Same as a form, no different. And then what you do is you save the serializer like you would a Django form, and it saves that information to the database. What you then do is you send a response back to the front end, which is the data from the serializer. Send information in, the serializer takes the information, checks it, validates it, saves it to the database, sends the information back. Okay, that's what we're doing in this post method. If it's not, if there's an error, then we spit back a 400 bad request. We know in, it's not in views, we know in status, where is it there, that 400 is bad request and it will spit back a 400, okay? And then if the encoding of the, if it doesn't come in as, as a proper JSON, um, then the decoding will fail and we'll send back a status 400 with an error message as well, okay? So we're handling the information coming in in this post request via a view, same as you would in a view in Django, okay? But now what we need is a router to route the traffic from the endpoint to the view. So what we need is Uh, in previous uh, courses, I would have put a URLs or a router file in here, but we're just using it from the, um, the DRF course, so the URL uh, conf file. So, okay, we've just added that. So, uh, we've imported what's different. We've imported the cause views that we just created, and we've added a new path to URL patterns. Now, this is a this is a um, API view, um, again like a class based view. That's why we've got the as view at the end. Um, endpoint is contact. And it's core views, contact views. So it's very similar to a URL pattern that we'd normally use in Django anyway. So this is why it's so easy to kind of get your head around if you're good at Django. And that's the that's the that's the router. I think. No. What do we do when we create models in Django? We register them so we can access them in the built-in admin page. So if you go into admin.py and save this code, it will give us, it will register contact to the admin page and gives access to any instance that is saved to the database. Last thing we want to do is migrate the changes that so we've got it in the database. Don't want that. Don't want that one. Let's go to CD backend. Remember you need to be in backend to invoke the manage.py file. 
no module name Django filters. Ah, uh, right, okay. No module, you know, the reason that's done that is because we have not got a virtual environment. You see that in the bottom left? There's no open bracket ENV. So what I need to do is VENV backslash scripts backslash activate dot BAT because I'm on a Windows machine. Uh, CD back in the back end and then use those same pieces of code again. There we go. Good. We now have, you see, we've migrated contact and uh, we might, so we've created a migration file and we've migrated it to the database. So by running those commands, we've created this file here. And you can see we're creating a model called contact with all of these fields. So we've got ID, which is a UUID field, created, modified, title, description. So with one line of code in models here, because we're inheriting all of this, it actually creates a whole bunch of other fields, which is it. And then we've migrated it to the database. Good. Now we are in a position to um, make a call to the data, uh, make a call to the API. So what we'll do is we will deactivate. Oh, just deactivate your virtual environment when you're doing this. We will CD back one, so we're in DRF course. And now what we want to do is we want to fire up Docker. So you go Docker compose up dash D dash dash build. What that will do, that will call, that will call this file here. And whilst that's just doing what it needs to do, I'll just show you what that, what's in there. We're creating two containers, okay? So the API, this is the Django app, and another app, which is a Flask app, which is a really, really small, lightweight container that has curl HTTPy installed, which will allow us to make a HTTPy request to the API. HTTPy, sorry, HTTPy is very similar to curl, except the response you get is really, really easy on the eye. Um, and it's, it's much, it's just better. I find it better than just a normal curl request. Now Docker should be running. Happy days. Um, look at the app. Sorry, that's a bit small. There we go. This is the app. So this is Flask. And then I'll be doing a lot of zooming. And then we've got the API. There we go. Which is very similar to what you'd be seeing if this was running as, in your local terminal. Okay. So that's working perfectly well. I'm really happy with that. So we're going to app and open up the CLI, which is the equivalent is a command line uh, interface. It's the same as your terminal. It's just we have uh, access to HTTP. So what I'll do, I'll go back into module three and I will, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? We will make this, this call. So what is this? HTTP, that is the, um, that's how you invoke a call using HTTP, similar to curl. We give it the endpoint. In this case, API is the name of the um, host for the Django project. Before it had been local host or 127.0.0, the um, 8000 is the port. No different if it was local host 8000. It's just when you're in Docker in this course, you'll be using API. We pass through name message and email they're the three fields copy this back in docker paste it there and then press enter and you can see that it's i can't i'm zoomed in so i haven't got access but you can see the json at the bottom there that is the response we're getting from um, the api so it's saying that it's actually created an entry in our database with an ID of 881896, da, 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 da. So that tells me it's worked. Now I can demonstrate that it's worked by logging into the admin page, but I won't in this module. Perfect, that is exactly where I want it to be at the end of this module. We've got a new configuration of what a directory should look like on the left hand side here, but we're not gonna look at that, so don't worry. But please double check before you move on to the next module. So thank you very much and I'll see you in module four.
Okay, module four. Let's, uh, sorry, I'm recording this as one here. I'm not editing at all. So um, all of these screens are open because they were open a second ago. So module four, let me just tidy things up in my screen. Right, there we go. Module four, going to preview. This is what it should look like. Pause, have a check. I'm not going to spend too long on that, on that. Clone down if you need to. Make sure your directory setup is the same as what it is on my screen. So in the last module, we built a contact endpoint. Now we want to do some tests. Okay, a, uh, An app without tests is broken by design. I forget who said that. It's on the Django website, but it's very much true. If you don't have tests in your app, then you know, you're not going anywhere with it. So what we'll do, we'll pick up all of these test cases that are pre-written. And I'll copy them and I'll go into backend core, open up the test.py file and drop them in. So if you're used to writing Django tests, what you'd normally do is you'd use um, you'd write some unit tests um, and you'd test different methods and views and things like that. Well, in REST framework, you have something called an API client. Well, that constructs a client similar to HTTPy or the container in Docker to make a call to the back end. This is just a built-in REST framework API client that allows us to make post, put, get, delete requests. So that's what we're bringing in there. We've also got API test case. Okay, so we're bringing in those. The contact test case inherits from API test case and is very similar to the Django test cases. Um, you need a setup method which constructs things in the uh, test database and then you can make calls against them. Okay, and then again, we're bringing in status like we did in the view. So um, we're going to do assert equals against some of these tests that we're constructing and we're expecting 200s, 400s, 404s and things like that. So if you use the Django, Django, these are just pretty normal Django tests, but because we're using REST API or Django REST framework API test cases, it will spend a little bit of time going through this, no more than a few minutes. So there's a setup method. We're calling self.client the API client. Okay, so we can access the API client by self.client in the methods themselves or in the test cases. We create a dictionary here, Python dictionary called self.data, and we add a name, message, and an email field. This is what we're expecting from the contact endpoint. And then a the URL, which is self.url equals contact. Okay, so let me minimize some of these. Now it's important to note that we, we, can, um, we can call these uh, when we run Python, uh, Python manage.py test, or it's, that's already built into the Docker instance. So when we fire up Docker, it automatically finds these tests and it runs them. So we've got what? Eight test cases here. So we test the endpoint. We test the create, end, sorry, the contact endpoint without a name. We test the contact where name equals blank. And then we do similar to the message and we do similar to email, except with the email, what we also then do is we do send an email, but we send a data type that isn't an email. So it'd be like a string without an at symbol in it. So that's quite thorough test cases for just single endpoints. So we've got eight tests. The first one is we, sorry, that's not the first one. The first one is we get the data from self data. The response is self.client, so this is the same as requests actually. You say response equal requests.post, very similar to that. In this, in this case, it's request.client.post. You pass through the URL and then you pass through the data, which is in this case the, what we're expecting. I would expect HTTP 200 OK, which is a 200 response. I would also expect that the database has one entry in it. And I'd also expect that that database entry title is Billy Smith because that is what's in here. Okay. Next, I won't go through each of these because I'm sure you understand testing. What I do, I take the data and I use the dictionary method pop to remove name. So now we've got a dictionary without a key value name. Post it, I expect it to say 400 because we're expecting name and it hasn't got one. Again, rather than popping it completely, I remove name and just add a blank string instead and expecting 400. So these last seven test cases, I'm expecting 400s. Okay, so that's testing. Go back in the module. What we can then do is we can use this command, python manage.py in Docker, 
but this time we want to go into the API container. That's the app container, I apologize. Go back in here, go into CLI. Changes I make locally will work in Docker because I'm using something called volumes. So it persists data. So essentially what happens outside of Docker in my project will also be in the Docker container. So those test cases will now be there, should be. There we go. So it's run eight tests. We've created eight tests, they're all okay. So every time we're looking for a 200, bang on, every time a 400, perfect. So now what we can do is, um, oh, we've already, we've already done this, we've already done this. As in we've um, sent the test case, we sent it, did this in the last module, we don't need to do it again. Okay, so, but we can check the database. So if we use python manage.py shell in here, enter, just zoom, it just invokes a, um, a Django shell or a Python interpreter for Django. Um, same as what you'd see locally. Now what we can do here is we can say um, from core.models import Import contact, so we can say C equals contact dot objects dot last and then C. Okay, and Bobby Stearman. Okay, that was the call we made in module two. Uh, module three, sorry. Okay, can you see that? It's probably quite small. I do apologize. Um, it's just you can't change the font size in Docker yet. Okay, apparently. So there we have it, that worked. Um, and that's it, that's module four. Your directory configuration should look like this on the screen. If it's not, pause, check, go back, make sure it does before you move on to the next module. I'll see you in module five, bye. Okay, module five. What have we got here? We've got a back end, we've got steps. Let's everything closed down. So we're picking up exactly where we left off in module four. So we go into steps, go in module five, We'll open up as preview. Um, we're halfway through the course now, so it's probably a good time for me to say, look, if you like this content, please visit Did Coding's YouTube channel um, and subscribe and click the bell because you'll like other content that I add. And also drop a like on this actual video on free code camp and a comment as well, because I do get to see them. It's always good to have feedback. So start and end of these um, step by steps, just make sure the configuration of, on your local machine matches what's on here. If not, clone it down. We've built our core app, we now need to build an e-commerce app. The e-commerce app will be used to, it'll have two endpoints, it'll have an items endpoint and an order endpoint. So we want users to be able to call an endpoint and retrieve all the items that we've got in our shop, okay? And also call the same endpoint and pass through a primary key to identify a single item. And then if they wanna purchase it, they place an order. So there'll be an order endpoint for that particular item. So on top of that, we wanna do some validation. So we wanna make sure that the item has stock. Uh, we wanna also make sure that only users that are authenticated can access these endpoints. So there's a few little bits we're going to be looking at over the next four modules. We're going to add token authentication to our app. Uh, we're going to build out some models, some new serializers. We're going to add some validation to the serializers and see where it leads us. Great stuff. Right. So let's use this command here in back end. If I close them down again, I will close the terminal down completely because I'm using Docker now. Remember, you can fire up Docker with Docker dash compose up dash d dash dash build no yeah that's right and that'll fire up this app um, in docker and when you're in there you can then use these python commands in the api so we'll quit the shell and we'll dump that in here yes we will in the api and this is me making these calls in docker however you will see them appear on my local machine and the reason you'll see them on my local machine is because the data persists and we're using volumes. So e-commerce is now here. We need to change the REST, frame, REST framework uh, variable in settings. The reason being is because we are adding token authentication. What we've done here 
is we've had we've added a default default authentication class called authentication.token authentication. So anywhere where we add a permissions class in a view will enforce authentication. So you won't be able to access that view unless you pass through a valid token. Okay, so that's the first step. In fact, if we uh, do DRF token authentication, this page here will walk you through all of the steps, but I'm doing that um, for you. So just follow the modules. So I've added that. We now need to add a new app into our installed apps. So back into settings, go into our installed apps, save over, and you can see now that we've got authentication added there. Okay. Stands to reason that we'll probably be adding some URLs and making migrations because we're getting new tables in the database. Okay. So let's go back to our URL conf. And you can see now we've got a new endpoint and we've got a new. Oh, I do apologize. So we're in, importing from Django REST framework and we've got a new endpoint. Save that. So this means now we've got an endpoint in our project where when a user visits that endpoint and passes through a username and a password, they will then receive back a token. That token acts as an authentication token. So if we receive that then in the back end, we know that that token um, links to a certain user. Okay, keep tokens safe. Now we need to migrate those new tables that we've added in installed apps to our database. So we go back into Docker, paste those pieces of code in there. And zoom in, you can see now, can you see that? We've got uh, auth token, we've got initial auto and token proxy, which are the migration files for the tables that we now have in our database. Don't worry, we'll see them in the map built in admin table very, very soon. What we also need is something called a signal. Now, if you're familiar with uh, Django, you will know what these are. We want them a way of creating a token every time a user is created in the database. And the way we do that is we use a signal. Now, a single, a, a piece of code, which um, um, in Django we call a signal, something that receives a signal from a certain table um, based on an action. Now, that could be a pre-save or a post-save. So, when it when a database has a new instance saved in it, a signal is sent from the database and this receiver has an antenna and it picks up that signal and says, ah, okay, I need to do something. And in this case, it will be create a new token. That's what we're trying to do here. So we go into e-commerce, we have a new file called signals.py. Sorry, I'm not following the models, sorry, the module five steps um, step by step. I am going step by step, I'm not reading straight from the screen. So you can see we've got a post save signal. So after something's saved, we get a signal. We have a receiver to receive said signal. Um, what table? The core user table. So when a user is added to the database, that's who sends the signal. And what do we want to create? We want to take, create a new token, which is the new table we've created in our database. And this is what the code all looks like. We now need to wire that into the app. So when the app starts, the signal is active. It's looking for signals. And what we do in here, so we say def ready, so it's a ready method, pass through self. What do we do? We want to import from uh, e-commerce dot signals. Perfect. Now, when e-commerce starts, signals will be active. That's what this bit here is. What do we want to do now? We want to create our first user. We'll make it create a super user. So I want a super user, which is twofold. That will trigger that token. So we'll have a token. And it will also give me access to the built-in admin page, which I'll show you in a second. So I'll copy, paste that in there. Can you see? Don't necessarily need to see it, but there you go. Enter, and that will ask me for a username. Just be Bobby. Don't worry about an email address. Just a random password. There we go, user is created. I'd expect to see a token in the database. So, go in your browser. We will go to localhost forward slash admin because that's the URL that's in our Bobby password 
perfect. I expect to see Bobby in a user table, because that's my super user. If I look in tokens, there we go, it's created a token. And this is the key. So this is my authentication token. Perfect. You go back into modules, what we now need to do is we need to test the endpoint. So I expect that when I test this endpoint, i.e. make this call using HTTP or HTTP in the um, in Docker, I would expect to receive something like this, which would be an endpoint, a, a response, and it will say token, it will give me my, my new token. So what I'm going to do is take most of this, but you need obviously use your own username and password. So I'll copy this and I will go to the app container. Remember, we're making a call from app to API. Go into CLI, I'll drop that in there, and I'll say my username is Bobby. Password equals press enter. Perfect. See that? So it starts in 8B88. We go back into the database. AFBA8. Perfect. That's exactly what I wanted to see. That's it. We've just added what we are on module five, which is added token authentication to our project. This is really good stuff. So now we can add that to our view. So if somebody's trying to access information, they will only access information relative to that user. That's what we're able to do. Not always the case. You might just want to have authentication on certain views. Um, so that only um, authenticated or signed in users can um, access it. It's good if you imagine you've got a mobile app, which you know is completely dis uh, disconnected from the back end. Okay, same as a React or a Vue app. So where are we? That's it. That's module five. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in module six. Okay, module six. Um, let's go ahead and begin. Like I said, I'm recording this in one foul swoop. So. Please excuse the cluttered uh, left-hand side. So steps, module six, in preview. We've built our core app, configured everything. We've got a Django REST framework working. We've now got an e-commerce app with token authentication. In this module, just make sure your configuration, by the way, is exactly where it needs to be. On the left-hand side, it should look like this. If it's not, clone down. What we're going to do now is we're going to go through the same process we went in the core app. Build our models, build our serializers, build our views, build our URLs in that order. Okay? So remember, models relate to databases. So we need an item and an order model. So a model to catch all the items in the database. So go into back end e commerce models, drop them in there. And I'm not going to spend too much time going through this, but it's important you understand some of the methods. So we've got an item model with some fields, right? We've got a stock and a price. So what stock we have in the uh, database and what the price is. Now, price is in pence and pounds or cents and dollars, whatever the case may be. Doesn't really matter. We've got a method to convert it into, remember, if you're in pounds and pence, if you divide pence by 100, you've got your pounds. We've got managed stocks. We've got a method to um, increase stock, sorry, decrease stock by... A factor of whatever the order is okay and we've got another couple of methods here to place an order to check stock so when you place an order it checks the stock if there's enough stock or it's in the stock equals the order or is above the order then it calls manage stock so that's one of the validation methods we'll be using in the serializer and then we've got an order model which will relate to the user so a foreign key to the user will be the item that's been um, ordered and the quantity okay so then we'll have an endpoint to view all of the user's orders, okay? All of the items, retrieve a single item, retrieve a single order, retrieve all of the orders. So, okay, that's all we're doing in the models. We now need a new file called serializers.py. Sorry, I'm jumping forward. There we go, e-commerce serializers.py. You now need to pick up all of this code. Copy, go into e-commerce. Drop it in there and save. So we're bringing in the two models we've just created. And then for very similar to the core uh, core app, we're bringing in serializers, bringing in status and exception. The reason I'm bringing in exception is because I've got this class here, which is called a not enough stock exception. 
In a normal app, you'd probably have a number of file here called exceptions, and you'd have a whole bunch of them. So when you're validating, you can call, invoke certain raise certain exceptions based on validation. We're only doing one piece of validation. We're checking that the stock is high enough, or we've got adequate stock to cover the order that's coming in. So if, when calling the method check stock, um, stock is too low, we will raise not enough stock, which is a 400 bad request. The detail will say there is not enough stock and it'll be an invalid code. Okay, model serializer, item serializer, order serializer is another model serializer. So these serializers, again, I spoke about this in module two, I believe, there's, there's a whole bunch of different serializers. You don't need to use model serializers. Like I said, that points it to model fields and it kind of does this, um, this clever um, model matching, uh, sorry, field matching. You can use other sorts of serializer. It's just, there's one called just serializer, in which case you need to specify what those fields look like. Um, for this, you know, outside of this course, you might want to do a deeper dive on that, but we're using models. It stands to reason that we can use a model serializer. So this item serializer has got no fields. We're not adding any fields. Class meta, model item, and we've got item, sorry, title, stock, and price. Okay, they're three fields that we have in the database. Order serializer, however, it, we're using an item primary key related field. What we're doing there is we are saying that the item field in order serializer, remember that we're, we're cleverly pointing fields towards model fields. We're saying that that particular field identify it by its primary key. There's a foreign key link between the two tables. So we're identifying that link via a primary key. I hope that makes sense. Um, same meta as, as, as above, but this time we've got a validate method. That validate method will be called when we call um, when we save the, um, sorry, when we call it is valid. So the is valid method will call validate and it will check to make sure that all the information is as expected. Now, in this case, what we're trying to do is, yeah, check the fields, other fields. Okay. Bang on. Perfect. After that, we then want to check the stock. Now, if the stock is too low, it will be, um, we will raise this not enough stock exception. So it'll be not valid, does that make sense? So that's why we've got this method in there. It's being called when we call the is valid method in the serializer. Okay. Then I've created a few models, bop them in the admin file here so we can access them in the built-in admin page. Don't need to go too further on that. And we need to migrate those new tables to the database. So if we open up Docker again, open up the API container, so not the app one, the API container, open up CLI, pop them in there, press enter. There we go, we've created an item table and an order table. We should be able to see those in here. If we update, happy days, we've got an items, we've got an order. Actually, let's go ahead and create some items, shall we? Add an item, test one, test one. We'll have a stock of 10, price, 300, save and add another, test two, test two, stock of 20, price 500, that'd be five pounds, right? Okay, we've now got items in the database. So when we do call the endpoint, we should see something. That is it, that is the end of module six. So in the next module, we'll start adding the views and the, the routers. The module after that will add some tests and we should have a fully functioning app at the end of that. So thank you very much for watching. Make sure your root directory is what it needs to look like before you move on to the next module. I'll see you in module seven. Okay, module seven, here we are. So two more modules, including this one. There we go, module seven. Look at this in preview. Make sure your configuration on the left-hand side matches this. If you don't, clone down. Okay, our e-commerce app is picking up speed. We've got our models, we've got a serializer. We now need to wire it into some views. So we need to pick up all of this code. We need to drop this into backend e-commerce views, paste. What we're doing different to what we did in core, this, we're bringing in is authenticated. Remember we've wired in token authentication. So by bringing this in and adding this to our views, 
that will invoke the authentication class that we have in our settings, which is token authentication. We're expecting a token to be sent via the request in the header as um, authorization or authentication. So we've got an items view. We've got some mix-ins here as well, actually. So um, the good thing about this is a generic view set. Okay, so we've had an API view. We're now using a generic view set. Generic view set has um, built-in methods such as retrieve. Uh, what are they? Retrieve, um, list, create, update. I forget what they all are now. Um, but by using these, uh, the generic view set and some mix-ins, you get very, very similar to the um, generic views in Django, actually. A lot of the methods are all built in. You don't need to do a lot of heavy lifting, especially when we're working with model um, serializers. Okay, you can see a good example of this. This is the item view. Okay, we've got no methods. We're just passing through permissions, we're telling it what the query set is. And we're telling it what serializer to use. By using those um, mix-ins, I've got a list endpoint, and as in um, show all, and I've got a show and retrieve. So it's a get request for a single item. Okay, so we pass through the UUID or the ID of an item, you're retrieving one. Very powerful. Next, we've got an orders view set here. Similar, passing through everything. I can't remember, if, actually, that's probably a, the hangover. So we're using the list and retrieve to get single orders, okay? Um, we're using this update one, which I'm, I don't think I'm actually using. We've probably got access to that, view, that uh, URL, because that's what we're doing here. It, the, the view set, the generic view set will give you access to methods, but it'll also construct those endpoints for you as well. Um, on a API view, you need to add the as view method when you're wiring up the URL, the URL router, but with a generic view set, you do it slightly different. I'll show you in a second. Difference here is, again, permissions class. We've got a create method here. So this is what we're going to be calling when we create an order. Different to core is we're passing through to the serializer the data, okay? If the serializer is valid, so we're gonna call that, is there enough stock? If there is enough stock, we're not saving the serializer because this is a model serializer linked to an order. We're not creating, um, we, we, we have to place an order, we're calling a place order method, so it's, we're not necessarily just saving a serializer, we're doing it slightly different, we're calling a method in a model. So we're getting the item, specific item based on the PK, the primary key, and then we're calling the order, place order method, which will create that order in the database. And then we respond with the, or we pass through the new order that we've created to the order serializer and the data. So that's how we're sending the data back to the user. Okay, that's the views, very simple, right? We now need a router, go back into models, we're doing all of this in URL conf, so we copy this, Go into DRF, uh, uh, DRF course, go into URL conf, and we're gonna add some bits, okay? What are we doing? We're bringing in the views from e-commerce, and then we're wiring up these generic view sets different to the API view, okay? We're, called, we're putting as view here, same as a class-based view in Django, very similar API view. These are different, these are generic view sets. Um, so we're using uh, regex, so it's a regular expression URL, um, e-commerce view, so this is the view set itself. Remember, notice we haven't got as view at the end there. Base name is item and order. And then what we do, we're registering those to the router. The URL patterns become your, the URLs from the router. Remember, so although we're registering things to router, because we're using generic um, view sets and a whole bunch of other stuff, that router has a whole bunch of um, URLs um, so we'll have a retrieve and a list and a get with a PK that are already built in just by registering this. So the URL patterns becomes vast. And then what we do is we append these three URLs to the URL patterns and that becomes our whole bunch of URL patterns for the project, okay? That's that, that's module seven. We are good to go. The reason uh, I've stopped it there is because we're gonna be doing testing in module eight. It's the final, last piece, we'll be doing some unit testing and then we'll be testing those endpoints, okay? So that, just make sure that your configuration is looking how mine does or looking at does in the modules and you'll be good to go. Thank you very much for watching. Module eight next. Perfect, right, module eight. Module eight, let me close some stuff. Open up module eight. Good.
before we start, make sure your configuration is exactly the same. If not, clone down from GitHub. Let's move on to the steps. So like uh, module four, when we've done the testing for our core app, let's do it again for e-commerce, except this is a little bit more complicated. Doesn't need to be any more complicated. I won't go into a, a big deep dive because I've already spoken about the API client and test cases. So we're creating a client is a callable very much like the request package. Um, so we're calling uh, the, the API um, testing and adding it to a test database. Inheriting the API test case here. So we have a setup method. We're creating some dummy information similar to what I did in the admin page earlier, adding five items. We're creating a self items variable here, which is all of the items in the database. We're creating a user. Well, we know when we create a user, we're also creating a token. We're creating a couple of orders, okay, against the first item. That way we can call the order at endpoint. Uh, token, so we're creating a token. We know that, we've just created it, yeah? So it's self-token is, is for this user here. And then the client is API client. And then difference here is that on self-client, we can call the credentials method and pass through the token so we'll add a header to each and every call remember we've part we've got permissions class in these views so if we don't have this we're going to hit a failure each time so we're passing through the token so how it will be written it'll be token space so it'll be it will say authorization and it will say uh, token space and it will be the token key okay and that'll be in the header of every call and then we have how many what have we got here do -do 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 -do. we've got a few um, one, two, four, six, eight, ten, ten-ish, ten test cases. So, what we're we doing? We are um, checking out what's in the database. We're expecting five. If there is happy days, we've got. Um, we make a call to the item endpoint. Remember, we've got a retrieve list or a list method that will bring back every item. So we're making a call to it. We're expecting status two hundred. That's the first endpoint. Now we want to get each item. So what we're doing, we're going to cycle through all of the items and then we're going to make five calls to the endpoint. You can do this differently, but this is just one way of doing it. So I'm calling the endpoint five times and I'm saying, right, get the item with PK from the item from the database. So item.id. We're expecting a 200 because we know they're there, right? So we're getting a response 200. Then we get then we get a little bit complicated. So test order is more than stock. So we're now calling methods, right? So um, for items, so it, these are methods in the item database. So current stock is, um, so we're getting the current stock. And then we're saying, I check stock. So we're passing through. So make check that the order is more than stock. So we'd expect that to be false. We go through, I'm not going to go through each of these, but I'm basically testing every outcome for the endpoint. So have we got too much stock? Have we not got enough stock? Does the stock equal the order? Um, what happens if we um, don't send um, an item ID? Something along those lines. Okay, so I'm just going through. I mean, you could probably be a lot more um, thorough than this, but these are the tests that we've got. Modulate. Okay, so we can now go in here, go into Docker, I'm in API, which is correct. Move that up there. Drop test manage.py test in there. We've now got 18 to 18 core, 10 in e-commerce. I'm expecting there we go. Okay, all the tests work. This is where you want to be. Now let's go ahead and test some endpoints. I need module eight opened. And this is how you'll probably need to do it as well. So I'll open up module eight without it being in preview mode the reason being is because every place it says your name I'm gonna control H and change it to the username of the person in the database I know it's Bobby I'm gonna change it I'm gonna change your password whenever you see your password I'm gonna change that to my password so what we're doing here I'm just creating the HTTP endpoints your token every time i see your token i'm going to change that to the token in the database which is this one here 
copy. Uh, change all the loads. And then you've got um, UUID for item. So you can see here we're calling the item endpoint. So your UUID will be an ID that appears in the database. So we go into items, change this one, copy. Not change that one. Oh, sorry. This work gets a little bit difficult when you're just doing a Right, and then we get on to, after that we get on to orders, so we won't, won't look at those yet. Okay, cool, so we go back in preview. I should now have those, yeah, we do, right, so spend some time going through these. So let's test all the endpoints there. So call our endpoints, here are the requests we can make to our new endpoint. So we've got, first, what I'll do, I'm gonna keep going backwards and forwards, but we go to the app, container going to CLI and what we'll do we will drop this in there so we're calling the API auth to get a token there we go token it works I'm going to zoom in each time I'm, I know it's small I do apologize but at least you've got instructions you've got the code next we want to um, check and get all of the items. Remember, this is the um, domain, the endpoint is item. Now, that is a retrieve all. We're getting all items in the database, providing we send through the token. Um, back into Docker, drop it in there, and I expect to see two items, we've got two in the database. Now, what happens if I remove the header with the authentication token? There you go, not authenticated. Perfect, that's exactly what we wanna see. Next, we want to retrieve one item that we have in the database. There we go, pass through the UID, and it gets a single retrieve one item. What else have we got? This got uh, retrieve all orders. Uh, yeah, we can look at that one. Back to Docker, retrieve all orders. We've got two, I haven't got any orders in the database. Okay, let's make an order, shall we? Um, your UUID authentication. Um, ba -ba -ba -bam. This will place an order for item ID. Sorry, I'm, I'm moving around on this. I probably should have looked. Right, so if I change that this will retrieve all orders this will retrieve a single item this will place an order for an item so let's place an order for an item shall we sorry not handy when you're making a video so what is this doing so we call in http we're calling the order endpoint, we're passing through an authentication token, and then we're creating a JSON uh, data type, and we're sending through the ID of the item and a quantity. I know that we've got the stock of one. Let's copy that. We'll drop that in here. Now we'll create an order. If I do that again, and change the quantity to 1,000, I know we don't have a stock of 1,000, that should say, there is not enough stock. Remember, we're validating that. And if there's not enough stock, we're raising an exception. Brilliant. So now we can call the, let's see any trouble with Docker. You can't press up and get your previous. Let's check all orders. And then I won't keep you on here any longer because you can do this in your own time. So we should now see one order, right? There we go. Brilliant. That is exactly what I wanted to see. Just zoom in. We added an order of one, remember, and retrieved it. And uh, I also showed you, where is it, where is it, where is it? There we go. So what I'll do, I'll create another order just quickly, and I'll create that with five 
I believe I've got enough stock. There is. And we will then get all of our orders with this one here, copy, back in the docker, drop it in there, should now have two. Perfect. That's exactly what I wanted to see. That is it. That is the end of the course. Let's just recap quickly. What have we done? We have had, we've gone through eight modules. First two modules were all about getting the code, configuring a Django project, essentially. Nice and easy stuff. Um, we have then created a core app with a contact endpoint, a normal model serializer, and we've just got a post request. We're using an API view, which is similar to a Django class view. Brilliant. We've then invoked or added token authentication to the project, created an e-commerce app with an item and an order endpoint with permission classes. So only those that have got an authentication approval can view, retrieve, create information. So we have now created a very, very good, um, not production ready API, um, but it's a good API that you can use and hopefully refactor and use it in your own project. Now, I'd just like to thank everyone for watching. Um, if you like this content, then please visit Did Coding and uh, you'll see many more videos like this on my channel. Like this video on Free Code Camp and add a comment because I do get to see those comments. And comments from previous courses on Free Code Camp really has led to me building some other courses and tutorials. So um, just before I do close the video out, I would just would like to thank Free Code Camp one more time just for allowing me to create this uh, course and for them to post it on their channel. Keep up the good work, keep that free content coming. Again, thank you very much. And hopefully I'll be seeing you very, very soon. Bye-bye.